Welcome to the Freedom Project podcast. The Freedom Project exists to make freedom in Christ known to each and every person we can reach and to encourage and dialogue with those who have already found freedom in Christ. Your host is Joe Weber. Hello, friends. Welcome to the Freedom Project podcast. My name is Joe Weber. So happy to be able to spend some time with you today and that you invite us into your homes and your devices to share the word of the Lord with you. Uh, we like to talk about freedom in Christ here. So if you have a good freedom story, testimony that you would like us to speak about on air, just send it in to us. If you have a comment, please be, feel free to comment. We love to interact with you as we go through this journey in freedom together in the name of Jesus Christ. So like, follow, share, do all of those things that uh, you do on social media. And uh, as I said, we're just so grateful to be with you. I'm sitting today with uh, Pastor George Sinclair. George, thanks so much for coming in today. I know it's your day off. <laughs> um, we're, uh, why don't you just give us a couple of minutes, uh, give a little snapshot of what your life looks like today. I, I became a Christian uh, 100 million years ago. The wheel <laughs> had just been invented, actually, yeah. and, uh, but when I was in grade 12. And um, actually, I became a Christian through the Jesus People Movement right. way back in the day. And uh, eventually, I became, um, ended up becoming an Anglican. I was this very rare in Canada Anglican evangelical, <laughs> and uh, I was ordained in 1985. Right. I served three years in a suburban church. I spent uh, almost seven and a half years in uh, looking after churches in Eganville, Killaloo, Tremor. Oh, yeah. Up the valley. Up the valley. And then I've been in an urban church uh, since 1995. Um, in 2000. And, uh, uh, seven, the Anglican Diocese of Ottawa uh, started blessing same-sex marriages and same-sex unions. So in conscience, uh, me and my congregation uh, in February of 2008 became the second Anglican Church in Canada to separate uh, from the Anglican Church of Canada over the issue. Mm. Uh, it was eventually sued uh, for what would have been seven figures by the diocese. Um, we settled out of court. And uh, in uh, 2011, we changed our name to the Church of the Messiah, and uh, we walked away from our building and our assets. And uh, we have been uh, that church ever since. I'm married, have kids, grandkids, all that type of stuff. So Right, so you're a Bible-based church, Bible-based teaching at the Church of the Messiah. Um, is it a large congregation or have you a growing congregation? Well, boy, it's hard to, with COVID, uh, U.S. pastors, all, we're all trying to figure out what our congregation sizes right, are right now. Right. You know, before COVID, uh, we would have been about, you know, 130 yeah. uh, Sunday. So I don't know if that, is that a big church? I guess in well, downtown you know, Ottawa, it's not I'm tiny. From, I'm from Perth, so it's a big church from, uh, <laughs> it's, it's all relative, right? It is, um, yes. George, you know, there's lots of stuff going on in the church today. The church, I feel, is uh, on the on the cusp of a great awakening, but I know that we're also in, in some dire straits as it comes to dealing with social issues uh, within the church. Within the church family, there's a lot of separation and division around some issues, and, and some of these issues are difficult to talk about. Uh, some of those big issues being uh, gender dysphoria, as you mentioned, same-sex marriage. Um, it's kind of a tough line to walk for us who love the Lord and are called to love people. Uh, but also to stand on the Word of God. And I know that you and your uh, your church have recently had a conference on this issue and uh, have some insights possibly on how people can walk with the Lord through these difficult times. Just uh, as I say, then I know it's a tough issue that lots of people don't want to talk about. I know this is affecting families every, in every church going. Uh, my own family, I have some of those issues to deal with, with some grandchildren. Uh, and I'm just, uh, yeah, I'm interested in your thoughts about how your conference went and what you kind of looked at during that. So here's here, a couple of things. That's a, a good... A big question. That's a big, big yeah. question with lots of facets. The first thing is I'm, um, one of my hats that I wear is uh, I'm the chair of the Dig and Delve Apologetics Conference. This is a leadership team that mm -hmm. puts on this yearly conference. We've been going since 2012. If people were to Google Dig and Delve, they could watch a range of things. Uh, we did a, a conference just at the beginning of April called, uh, I think, Christian Sexual Morality, colon, Repressive 
or impressive. Mm. Um, for a variety of reasons, we haven't uh, released it to YouTube yet. I think it's at the end of June. We're going to put it on, uh, make it available right. completely on YouTube. Uh, but here, just several things. So first of all, there's this Australian writer called Steve McAlpine who wrote a small but very, very helpful book called Being the Bad Guys. And one of the things which is hard for Christians is that in the last, I don't know, maybe eight years, somewhere within this last very short period of time, we've went from sort of maybe being sort of like part of culture or just maybe a bit of a weird part of culture to actually being the bad guys. Right. Like for many, many people who lead in our culture, our views on sexual morality make us evil. And that's a very, very, it's a, it's a very sudden social revolution mm -hmm. which has happened in Canada. Uh, it's very hard. Cana no Canadian, including no Canadian, Canadian Christians are Canadian. That's right, yeah. And, so we want to be nice and friendly. Yeah, and we don't like being the bad guys. Mm -hmm. And that makes it very hard. Um, the last big s social revolution that happened in our culture was the late 60s, early 70s with the counterculture and all of mm -hmm. that. And the mainline churches weren't able to adapt to that at all. And they've been in decline since the early 70s. Uh, evangelical and Pentecostal and charismatic churches, by and large, many of them did adapt to that and have thrived. Mm. But the, the things that have allowed them to thrive are now, all of a sudden, we've come to this new social revolution. And so there's a lot of confusion about how to move forward with it. Right. The, the bottom line on all of this is that um, Jesus is still the Lord. Amen. He's still the Savior. The gospel still works. And the Bible is not only true, it's also beautiful and wise. Mm -hmm. And the most ancient sexual revolution is the one portrayed by a gospel-based gospel or gospel-shaped understanding of the Bible and a biblical understanding of the gospel. And that, as part of it, I mean, the Bible's talking about sexuality isn't the gospel. The gospel is the fact that God invaded his cr fallen creation by sending his son right. and that he was Emmanuel, that he lived amongst us, he lived the life we couldn't live, and he died the death, uh, and his death upon the cross was in a sense him taking the doom that we deserved. Mm -hmm. And that um, what he offers us is that when we trust him, we receive, in a sense, by a pure act of grace, he takes upon himself the doom that we deserved, and he, we, he gives us the destiny that he deserved. And that's the gospel. But one of the consequences, but the gospel has consequences. Right. And one of the consequences of the gospel is uh, that God is going to uh, continually try to reform and renew us and revive us to his creational to his, his intents right. about how he designed human beings to be. So, so part of the... Part of the issue is, I, I believe, and, and, I, and you may have a different thought, part of the issue that we have around sexual sin is, is we separate it. Sin is sin is sin to the Lord, right? He, he names gossip and lying and stealing and sexual sin all in the same category. But we take that sexual part of the world and we separate it from the rest of the sin package that we talk about as we try to disciple people with the Lord. And it seems to me that society has really set this apart. And uh, um, it's difficult to know how to navigate that in a loving, Christ-like way. So have you got some thoughts about that? I mean, so my first thought is, that, yeah, that's partly why I was saying in the last six or seven or eight years, there's been this mm -hmm. fairly sudden change in our culture. And so churches need to, to talk about this, about how to navigate it. But he, the bottom line is this. The Bible is clear on it. That's part of the problem. Right. The biblical teaching is very simple and very clear. And that's what partially makes it very complicated. Um, and what the, much of what the Bible describes as sexual sin, the world actually sees as virtue, mm -hmm. as heroic, as what we should be aiming for. And so there's a very, very, very big difference. And so part of the thing is, is that we as Christians have to just be very comfortable and confident about what the Bible actually and teaches. And stand on that word. And be able to stand on it. How we navigate you know, specific situations is going to be, sometimes can be very complicated. But at the end of the day, we have to be prepared to suffer for uh, for the biblical for our teaching for yeah. for our belief, but uh, you see, the fact of the matter is, is that the 
so the, the gospel is the gospel, and the gospel has consequences. And, and those consequences aren't just something like, you know, pray more or something like that. But part of the gospel understanding is that the God is the creator of all things, and he mm-hmm. sustains all things. So what the Bible calls us to and calls all human beings to is back to his creational intent. Um, in the uh, English Reformation, the marriage ceremony they developed, they have this preface to the marriage ceremony that says, marriage was instituted of God in the time of man's innocency. In other words, before the fall, God mm. designed marriage. human beings so that a man could marry yeah. a woman. A male could marry a female. And, and that the majority of, of us w- would do that. It wasn't required, but the majority of us would. So really, um, you see, part of, the, part of the issue is we need to seek the good of the city. We need to seek, I, I'm right now preaching through the uh, Abraham story. Right. I'm just about to come up to the Sodom, and I'm going to be mm-hmm. preaching on Genesis 18 this week, Genesis 19 next week. And you see that part of what goes on in Genesis 18 is Abraham's intercession for Sodom. Mm-hmm. Because God takes no delight in the death of a sinner, but rather that he will or she will turn from their wickedness and live. Yeah. So, you know, uh, we don't understand the good of the city from the, the city's point of view, but from the biblical point of view. And the fact of the matter is, is that the biblical teaching of moving towards being at home in your body, like for people who genuinely do not feel at home in their body, that mm-hmm. is a terrible situation. It is. And... But the, the gospel will always lead you to, to the point where you become at home in your body. And, and the other thing, sorry, I need to take a step back. Another very important thing for Christians to, to be able to be very clear about is that every single human being is sexually broken. Mm-hmm. It's not that heterosexuals aren't sexually broken and people who aren't, you know, who ex- experience same-sex attraction or they identify as trans, that they're broken and we're not. Mm-hmm. You and We're, I are both sexually broken. We both need the lordship of Christ. We need the, 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 the reformation of God's word. We need the comfort of the Holy Spirit. We need the comfort of Christian community to mm-hmm. help form us, to repent of our sin, and to turn to Christ for wholeness. Um, picking ourselves up when we, when we fall, knowing that he is a, a loving savior. Amen. Yeah, so, th- and that's, seems to be part of the issue it's uh there seems to be a culturally a separation that's coming so hard in between us and when we understand as you said that we are all broken we're all fallen we're all results of a broken world from the time of the garden there's basic principles that god put in place in the garden that run through christianity or uh Worship, worshiping God and Christianity through the Old Testament and the New Testament that, that always stand. Uh, families are one of those things. These are the things that are under attack by the devil all the time. Um, so these people, uh, it's, it's interesting to me that you mentioned people who feel, who don't feel like they belong in the body that they have. That is a real, uh, a real situation, absolutely. And, and I don't know how we deal with that with people uh, biblically. We love them. You know, we're called to love everyone. Uh, we try to understand them, but we need to also let them know in a loving way that uh, that's not what the Lord had meant for them. So what do you think about how we move on that if if it's if it's your daughter or your granddaughter or your son yeah that's a really big that's a really big topic it's a tough question, the, the, yeah. the, the quick thing would be um, is to ask the lord to guard your heart that you don't start to view them as an enemy mm-hmm. and you don't start to view them as a real threat it's amazing how often the new testament and the old testament the command to not fear comes to god's people and a lot of times we don't, don't want to acknowledge that we're reacting out of fear. Mm. And we need to maybe even just come to the Lord and say, Lord, am I, am I afraid of these woke people? Am I afraid of this stuff? Am I living in fear of this? And, and then, you, Lord, do a work in my heart that I lose that fear, that, that I have fear. a great confidence in your word, and that I, you know, that I, I, I have an actual love for this person, mm. like the particular person in front of me. Um, you need to pray, obviously, for a change of their heart. Mm-hmm. The one other thing I'll, I'll say about this is if you read the biographies of people who have come out of the LGBTQ plus world, um, it's an encounter with Christ. Mm-hmm. It doesn't begin by them starting to see that the, the error of their way is on these things. If, you know, it, it's, they, they come to Christ. 
and then they realize you know the you know why they 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 these other changes in their life have to happen. Yeah. So I, I don't want to over spiritualize it, and I. But it is you know hard to know how to deal with the pronouns and and all of that type of it's, stuff. That's a tough one. Yeah. Like, um, you know, churches need to have safe conversations with each other about how to navigate some of these things, right. and it it can involve risking the. You know, the hostility of your daughter or your granddaughter yeah. or something over these things. And it needs to be a two-way conversation, you know. We need to love and respect those people um, who who are feeling that way in, within our families or within our church. But they also need to love and respect the place we come from, from a biblical standpoint. And so, hopefully we can find a mid-ground there. I mean, p- part of the issue is, right... Um, uh, there's this thing, if you read like academics, they talk about expressive individualism, mm. two big words. <laughs> but if you think about it, for a lot of the, the, the wisdom of a lot of the world is this, that only I can know who I really am. You don't know who I really am. You know, nobody knows who I really am. I need to know who I really am. And, um, and, and that is a, and, 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 uh, and then I need to have the freedom to, to become who I really am. I need to actualize that, and you need to applaud it. And it's actually, and I hope I'm not offending people who are watching this, you know, but it's, it's actually a, a highly narcissistic, self-loving view, thing yeah. because they don't view it that you, you have your view. And I, that's, that, that's that cultural before, mm-hmm. before when everybody was moral relatives. Now moral, they're moral absolutists. Right. And, and they need to be applauded. And that's a whole other issue. How do you talk with people who feel they need to be applauded, but you don't need to have any type of respect given to you. I mean, that's a whole other aspect of the... It is, and, it, that's, uh, and that's what brings the division within families and within churches. Well, and that, and obviously some people can be angry, intolerant, mm-hmm. violent. Uh, you know, Christians can also be narcissistic. Absolutely. <laughs> I know violent. a lot of them. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's me, it's me, it's me, oh Lord, yeah. standing in need of prayer. Um, yeah, 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 Absolutely. <laughs> George, you know, uh, it is a tough topic, and maybe, and, and it, it goes so much deeper than we can cover it in a, in a short interview. Um, it's good to know that your church is looking at these things, and through uh, Dig and Delve, was it Dig and Delve? Dig and Delve, yeah. You're, you're looking at some of these questions and trying to get some information out to people on how to navigate these cultural issues that are 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 really coming into the church. If you had a couple of minutes, and you do have a couple of minutes right now, and you wanted to uh, speak directly to our viewing audience and give them a word of encouragement or an invitation uh, or share a Bible verse, what would you take a few minutes and just talk to our audience and and share some stuff with them? Yeah, the, the first thing I'd just say is, is this. Uh, the biblical teaching on this, that God made us male and female, and that they're, and hence man and woman, um, and that uh, biblical teaching is that God designed us for faithfulness, um, in, uh, of one man married to one woman, uh, that, and God designed us for that, and anything other, any type of sexual knowing other than that of one man to one woman, or any type of sexual stimulation for that is sin. And for those of us not called into marriage of one man to one woman, we're called to live a life of singleness and celibacy, and that that's, in fact, really good for us. And this teaching is very, very, not only is it very clear, but it's deep, very, very deeply part of the Bible. In fact, if you look at the New Testament, there's two types of sins that often are the most, uh, are considered to be the most important for the church to deal with, idolatry and sexual sins. And, and if you look at all of the specific teaching on these things, of, you know, this, you know, what I just described, the faithfulness in marriage of one man to one woman, or abstinence and singleness, it's not only what is very clearly taught in the Bible, there's nothing in the Bible that talks at all, like zero, that defends either the, a gay lifestyle or a trans lifestyle. And then not only is it very specific, and there are no counterexamples, but if you go down then to how the Bible understands the doctrine of creation, the doctrine of what a human being is, you'll see that that's also consistent. What I've just said is consistent with that. If you go down even deeper into the the symbolism of the Bible, the the imagery, like that Christ and, and the bride of Christ and all of that, it's there too. So this is a very, 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 very deeply taught part of the Bible. 
and it's uncomfortable for us to think that we might be, we used to be popular where people liked us and that if they hear our view on this, they will no longer like us. They'll actually now view us as a bad person. And I'm very Canadian. I understand. I really do understand. If it was just up to my flesh, I would just say, go for it all. Like in my flesh, I am very Canadian. And we just really need to be very honest before God. Uh, this, I'm speaking to Christians here. We just need to be very honest with God about how clear the Bible is on this subject. Uh, and everything in the Bible, even when, the God, when God in the Bible confronts us about sin, he confronts to connect. He always confronts to connect. His heart is that nobody, he had, takes no pleasure in the death mm. of a sinner. He wants all of us to turn to him and live. And he is life. He is beauty. Mm. He is goodness. He is justice. He is truth. He is mercy. And uh, he is all of those things, not only for the surface of our lives, but for the very deepest part of our lives. And... Um, you know, if you struggle with some of these particular things, or if those who, you know, this modern term heterosexuals, you struggle with pornography or a range of other types of things, the Bible is wise. Its teaching is beautiful. Its teaching is just. And it is only, um, you know, my favorite verse in the Bible is, come to me all who labor and are heavy laden and I will take, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and to take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble of heart, and you will find rest for your souls. And that is completely and utterly true. And you can stake and shape your entire life around that truth. Amen to that. We take our rest in the Lord. You know, George, uh, I just want to thank you so much for, for uh, coming in. Uh, I know it was your day off, and to uh, to just take a few minutes to talk about this difficult subject. I think that we uh, made a, a bit of a start at that. Maybe we'll have a part two sometime and go a bit deeper. But uh, for today, thanks so much for being here. Thank you. And uh, thank you guys for uh, tuning in today to the Freedom Project. If you have any questions, if you have any comments, we'd be happy to hear them and respond to them. Um, if you uh, have a freedom story you want to share, uh, let us know about it. And if, if you just need to reach out to someone, find some Bible-based church, give yourselves over to someone that can help you, take you on a journey with the Lord, and you will understand this freedom that we have in Christ. And this freedom that we have in Christ will allow you to walk through this broken world in a way that gives you peace that surpasses all understanding. So thanks for joining in today. Remember our scripture that we have here, John 8, 36. If the Son sets you free, you shall be free indeed. Praise God. God be with you. And we'll see you all next time for another episode of The Freedom Project.